Grand Rising, my friends. Welcome back. And if you're new here, konnichiwa. We're going to have a good time today to finish out the week. Hope everyone, no, I know everyone is doing well. I know everyone is going to go to a strong weekend. <laughs> I messed it up. A strong end. Now we're not having no weakness about things we do. So, with that said, and the message here always being about that positivity, look down in the comment section. Say something nice about someone that you love, admire, respect, that mentors you. Send them this video. Share it with them and say, hey, I wrote something nice about you down in the Comment section you can read. Give them a little boost in a day. It's not such a bad thing to think of, huh? Uh, the market is doing better. We um, went down as low as like 47, low 47s for Bitcoin. Ethereum didn't go down much. Ethereum has kind of just been hovering. Cardano dropped down from its highs in the 90s, 290s. Um in that range down to 70s we're starting to we're starting to bounce back and starting to bounce back things are coming back if you look on the week still most of the projects either have gains or just minimum losses and we're down here into the top 30 okay all the way down shibu inu is the loser of the week so far with negative four percent it seems at least in this down to that point Everything else over the seven days is looking really well. So we will continue to keep an eye and understand that the market is going to go up and down. Cryptocurrencies, if you're not looking at the screen, we're looking at coin market cap. And Bitcoin is currently trading a little bit under 49,000, 48, 741, something seven hundred $747.81. Ethereum at $3,214. Leave it to the big, to the big two. Let us jump into today's stories. Robin Hood fate now rests with Dogecoin. So long, long, the long and short of it basically is that in the second quarter, it seems that happened to blink it by in the second quarter, Robin Hood largest source of revenue stopped being transactions in conventional markets like stocks and options. Instead, cryptocurrency trading led the way amid soaring interest in assets like Dogecoin, blah, blah, blah. And they start talking about novelty and all that garbage. So basically, they have a bill, $100 billion in assets and about... 22.69 22.69 of of that is crypto so about a fifth fifth of the assets you know or so but in terms of trading volume you know they get paid on you know it's commission free but some under the scenes they get paid money somehow <laughs> they find a way to get they the you know it talks in here how they were sued over their um they were a no fee trading platform, but still makes money from its customers' trading activity. Market orders are sent to third parties to the market makers that execute trades, and they pay some of those uh, proceeds back to Robinhood so they can beat your orders in. But that's a longer discussion another day. So, in the first quarter, second quarter of last year, um, cryptocurrencies' trading volume in terms of the fees that Robinhood earned was five point three million. Second quarter of last year. This year is 233.1 million, a 4,298% increase. Stocks dropped a little bit from last year to this year. Um, options raised, you know, people <clears throat> paying fees on options, but people, uh, the fees paid on stocks dipped a little bit from quarter 2020, quarter 2021. So Robinhood is, is a lot of money is now being made on cryptocurrency. I want to say, is it half of it like Doge? What is it? 62% of their uh, uh, crypto digital cryptocurrency trading came from Dogecoin trades alone. That means Dogecoin accounted for a little more than 30% of transaction-based revenue total. 
of everything. So, Robin is a hey, Vlad. Vlad is on the panel there with Elon and uh, Cuban, right? Vlad, Vlad on the panel now too, trying to trying to make sure things go right in Doge Dogeville. SEC could approve Bitcoin futures in October, analysts predict. The United States Security and Exchange Commission is likely to approve a Bitcoin futures exchange traded fund by the end of October. These Bloomberg ETF experts believe because of the fact that VanEck and ProShares withdrew their Ether, Ether futures contracts proposal, ETF proposals, that that meant that they were talking behind the scenes to the SEC that they were about to get their Bitcoin ETF approved. And it would look better for them if it looked like they were just focusing on one thing in these trying times to better protect the investors. So that is what basically the long and short of it. We're going some long and shorts today. I'm, uh, you know, it's getting near the weekend and I know everybody excited to go out here and run around with the with the with the wrong wrongs with Ronas. No, y'all be safe. I'm just I'm joking. Don't go run around with the Ronas. Be safe. Hope everyone is vaccinated, you know, from childhood and with all the vaccinations you can get. Even if you're my age and you had chicken pox and you now you're eligible for the shingles vaccine. You know. <laughs> it's been a very good thing in our society. Like SpaceX, SpaceX pause Starlink launches to give this Internet satellite lasers. So there's been a pause for about a month in the launches. There's sixteen hundred. Did they talk about it? It's on. Yes, there are currently over sixteen hundred Starlink satellites in orbit, and that number will continue to grow. Starlink has filed paperwork for up to forty two thousand satellites for the constellation. But in the past month, they haven't been launching them because they are putting laser terminals or laser crosslinks were added. I think I mentioned this before that the satellites um, are going to communicate in space because they're going to have line of sight straight distance with each other and there's going to be no obstructions like clouds, buildings and such. So they can use lasers to communicate. The constellation is going to be low orbit fairly bunched together relatively where they'll be lying to site and they can communicate via lasers, which is instantaneous data back and forth. Um, so it may even look like a, almost like a, a grid bouncing around your, the laser beam with your packet of information as it gets to where it needs to go and either beam down directly or to a ground station. And it said here, with this technology, SpaceX hopes that ground stations on Earth won't be necessary with every batch of satellites as parts of the constellation. Making this change could allow satellite internet coverage to reach areas where ground stations cannot be built. Told you, planes gonna use this, vehicles on a roll, you're gonna have Starlink, like you have satellites in a, um, you know, Sirius satellite in your car, you better have uh, Starlink as your data, military using it, so that's why they paused because they were putting, now they're adding to their batches of starlight, uh, satellites going up. And these satellites are not made to last forever. They're made to be almost, not, I don't want to use the word disposable, but you understand in the sense of, I think the lifespan is like five years or so. So they're made to eventually have to come out and they can just launch more up. Eventually they're going to use Starship to put a bunch of them in orbit at once. That's the plan. So... And also, they're going to cut the, the cost of the disk. The disk now is like $4.99, and they're saying they're going to drop that close to $250 before, fall, before falling again to $125, making it more affordable to the legions of Internet users desperate for the satellite broadband network. Originally, and so they're, also, they're already selling them at a loss at baseline, but I think they're finding ways to improve the manufacture of them to make it more efficient to where they're able to save money on the production. Because right now the, the dish used to cost, <clears throat> originally the dish cost 3,000 to produce before SpaceX managed to reduce the amount to 1,500 and then 1,300. 
And now I think they said that think a bit again. I think that'll be a quarter of the cost to what it is, and maybe in about a year or something like that. We made tremendous progress on the user terminal, but those are still expensive. But again, I think they'll be about a quarter of the cost to us right now, and maybe a year. So they're even thinking they're going to go down even lower. That's why they'll be able to charge. They may always sell them at a little bit of a loss, but a lot less than what they've been selling them at. You know, granted, they're not selling millions of them yet, but they would like to ramp it up. I imagine. I know Sirius used to have satellites, and they almost went down to like you didn't even need it. I don't know that their like their antennas became almost microscopic. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I think um, I heard Martina Roseblatt, uh, uh, I may be butchering uh, her last name, who used to own Sirius and formed it, who did a lot of the work with it. I believe she was saying that they had microscopic satellite antennas, but you got to double check that. But this is right in front of you. You can look for yourself. They're adding a human gene that um, in some individuals assist or probably, you know, contribute heavily to their obesity. It's a gene that causes RNA demethyl demethylation of um, DNA. And so they're using this protein that is that are in humans, FTO. Now, look, we got to have a discussion how we feel about this. This protein that is in us that they're going to add to plants to give them better yields and more drought resistant abilities. In tests, researchers found that by adding a gene that encodes for a protein called FTO, both rice and potato plants increased yields by 50 percent. The plants grew significantly larger, produced longer root systems and were better able to tolerate drought stress. Ooh, I had to take that. University of Chicago professor was one of the leaders of the research team. He's Nishwan Chan. I'm going to butcher his name. I apologize. Chan He. He's research focused on how genes are expressed in ways to regulate those processes. Processes. This used to be thought that RNA molecules read DNA and then produce then produced different proteins to carry out different tasks, but his team discovered that it doesn't. In other words, they this each the cell just doesn't blindly just read the DNA. It's markers on the DNA that tells the cells, hey, this is your part to read. And they found that place chemical markers to found that. And so they believe that this protein removes those chemical markers which inhibit growth. 50% increase. And the plants, they say, look normal. So, you know, now they're going to come and say, look, the, the earth is crying to us. The earth is, there's droughts. We haven't even mentioned, you know, tremendous droughts in the Western United States. You know, there's always droughts everywhere in the world. It's the way weather systems work. But it appears, and I don't know, it may just as you get older, everybody think that it may be a bit of egocentrism and, you wonder that about your generations, but it always seems like things are getting worse. And so the droughts, the wildfires, and, and you know, we've had a lot of hey, the hottest, the wettest, the coldest, all these different periods of, of on recorded history, all within recent times. And Palantir is buying gold, bought gold, and collected Bitcoin, so. This is something I'm gonna have to do a little bit more research to see, I mean, you know, I am a fan of science, but making chimeras, not so much. <laughs> chimeras, for those who know, are animal, human. Um, I mean, we use the word chimera for two cells that are not supposed to be together, chimeric in the, uh, together, but you know, since I'm thinking of animal human kind of hybrids that never seem to work out in, in science fiction or in lore of what came before us and if, if, if this civilization was not the first on this planet. But these four tech breakthroughs could help people live to 200 years old. Genetic engineering, regenerative medicine, wearables and AI combined to form a powerful antidote to aging.
You know we talked about that longevity here. Huh? So basically it's just saying those four here, genetic engineer, regenerative medicine, healthcare hardware, and health data. And we're going to go through each of them really quickly. You know, this is going to be long-term discussions on this channel and how they're going to change and how we need to be looking for the companies that are investing heavily in these technologies and seem to be making advances in these fields because, oh boy, you thought the internet was big. Imagine something that's worth 10 times more than the internet at one estimate. So let's get to it. Regenerative medicine. This is the ability, a lot of uh, several promising technologies and I'll point the way to doing just that. While it's still quite early, there are already a few FDA approved stem cell therapies in the United States targeting very specific conditions. Stem cells, cells whose job it is to generate all. So basically think of stem cells as like um, if you ever play uh, Uno, the Uno card, it could be anything. <laughs> I haven't played it on a minute. I think it didn't require it could be anything, right? Uh, so you got that card that can, you can flip the switch and make it anything that you need it to be. So using these to restore vision, restore cardiac function, restore, restore joint health, um, restore uh, tissue after it's been damaged, the we, spinal cord injuries, these, you know, this is one step. Even oh, wearable, the wearable they talk about in this article, they didn't get linked to the Neuralink type wearable stuff, and we'll bring up Neuralink here at one point. I may have to just one of these days show that video to, of Monkey Pong, because I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen that. Millions of people around the world who are waiting for a new heart, kidney, lung, pancreas, or liver will soon have their own replacement organs made to order through 3D bioprinting. Internal bioreactors are new methods of xenotransplantation, such as using collagen scaffoldings from pig lungs and hearts that are populated with the recipient's own human cells, the stem cells to create a new heart that was yours. It's going to be amazing in the future. And we'll, we'll 3D print the, coll the collagen scaffolding. It won't necessarily have to become from a pig or something else in the future. Probably can even use your stem cells to make the uh, cal um Collagen scaffolding in the future. Healthcare hardware, talking about wearing devices like Amazon's Halo or Apple Watch, Fitbit, Aura Ring, that these devices will be able to, and, and we get even deeper where it'll be monitoring your whole system. You know, imagine you, 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 in the future, our bodies will be like looked at by. Uh, artificial intelligent wearable devices like its own power plant or it's, it's you know it's city that it's keeping track of and watching all the systems and anything start to look a little out of whack send a message saying hey i need you to eat this or or take this supplement or we need to make this call it... but not for long soon healthcare will move from being reactive to being proactive this, the key to this shift would be low-cost, ubiquitous, connected devices that constantly monitor your health. While some of these devices will remain external and wearable, others will be embedded under your skin, swallowed with your breakfast, or remain swimming through your bloodstream at all times. And we'll argue at some point later. When I use the word, I joke about it. But we'll discuss how the reticence people are going to be very hesitant to allow a lot of this technology to be used initially <clears throat> they will constantly monitor your heart rate your respirations your temperature your skin secretions the content of your urine and feces flea fold, flea free floating dna in your blood that may indicate cancer or other diseases even the organic contents of your breath these devices will be connected to each other to apps that you and your healthcare provider can monitor and to massive global databases of health knowledge as a result, the chance of your disease being diagnosed early will become radically unshackled from the limitations of cost, convenience, and medical knowledge. Like, as, as a provider now, a lot of times we, you, it's cost analysis. Do, do, do we just order every test for every person that come in? No. It, 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 to find anything, you will have so many negatives that we, we would have spent all the money up. <laughs> and so that's why you can't. You have to, if you find symptoms or hear a story that makes you think, then you have to have that clinical acumen to say, all right, I know, let me order this test, let me order this study. But imagine that data is just constantly being updated, you know, 
Well, well now a test would be a two thousand dollar test we got to order or a eight hundred dollar test is being done um, up to the minute. At, at, you know, behind the scenes without even a cost involved because cryptocurrencies are handling the transactions between the AIs, between your AI that's who's taking care of you and the AI who works for the um, database that the insurance company who manages and pays for works for versus the AI of the, the massive database of the the algorithms that can put together the disease processes from the information. It's, it is going to be amazing. And speaking of which, health data and intelligence breakthrough, um, one final seismic, uh, seismic shift underpinning the longevity revolution, that's what they're calling it. Uh, I feel like I missed genetic engineer, but I guess I talked about it up here. They talk about oh, gene sequencing. I didn't talk too much about it, but that's gonna be one of the big ones. Um, let me come back just to that one. New technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 and other gene editing tools are empowering doctors with the extraordinary ability to actually insert, delete, or alter an individual's genes. So, you know, re rewriting the DNA of it. Ugh. And the health data is so able to tailor the approach to the individual. Like, that's always been a dream. I've always said, I wish we could just pull blood from people and say, all right, this is what you're missing. We need to supplement. Boom, boom, boom. Besides the normal thing, we'll talk about that in a second of sleep, exercise, nutrition. You know, if there are chemical imbalances that we knew instead of a shotgun approach that we had a more tailored approach. AI and data changed our reality. Computer models now look at massive databases of patients, genes, symptoms, disease, species, and millions of eligible compounds to quickly determine which material candidates have the greatest chance of success, for which conditions, and according to what dose and administration. It's talking about being able to speed up the process of drug development. In addition to major investments by Big Pharma, there are currently hundreds of startups working to implement the use of AI to radically reshape drug discovery, just as we saw happen in the race to develop COVID-19 vaccines. The impact that this use of AI and data will have on treating or even eliminating life-threatening diseases cannot be overstated. And I agree 100%. So those are some things to be thinking about as we are keeping an eye on what companies to invest in from a healthcare standpoint, how are, are they looking ahead and making those cloud computing solutions in a floppy disk world? You know, are they already thinking ahead and everybody think they're crazy and then they become the standard? That's where we need to be at with those because these are some very good tips from this longevity expert. And we just go get straight into it. Get regular checkups, dental, Go to the dentist, go get your regular teeth cleaning, take care of it. If you if you have insurance is not that pays for and you're paying for every month, it is not an excuse. If you do not get it yourself into a state where you can get dental insurance, get go, please go to the dentist, go get regular checkups. Stay focused on your. It's not a bad thing. Don't be afraid of they may not find out nothing. You don't want to find out nothing too late. That's what you don't want. Like I said, we're trying to get ahead of the game. Let food be thy medicine. Eat more plants. Avoid processed food. Drink more water. Include healthy fats. All very good advice. All of us can do this. All of us can drink more water. All of us can eat more plants. Even if you were a vegan, that's all you're going to eat anyway. So you need to eat plants regardless. Not I me, mean, you eat a lot of other stuff. I'm joking, but <clears throat> get moving. I tell people at least three to four, two to three times a week, and I want you to get to at least three to four times of raising your heart rate for about 30 minutes. And that's even if you just walk out of your house for 15 minutes, set an alarm. When it beeps, turn around and walk back home. Just do something. You need to get out. And and, and this is it's a lot more that go into it. Uh, today, my guy, my main man, Gave us some 30 mountain climbers for everybody to do. Look up mountain climbers. I, I've been uh, slipping on what the, what the ball been telling us to do. So I, I mean, I'll get back on that. But we got 30 mountain climbers today. Thinking of, it, thinking of which. That'll help get some of your moving done. Uh, but find, find some exercise that move you. I know for me, if you were to tell me just to 
go out and run or lift weights, that's not that fun to me. And I don't find that exciting. I get, I don't get interested and I lose focus in it. But Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has been found, I found it be extremely fun and extremely challenging and then, but extremely physically taxing and physically injuring, to be honest, but you'll be fine. Toughen up. So find something that you enjoy and love. Hey, look, we'll talk about that one when we talk about exercise. I'll do a deep dive, but I think everyone should do jiu-jitsu, but, you know. <laughs> eat early and eat less often. Talking about intermittent fasting. This actually is found in the clinical data shows that intermittent fasting and eating pattern where you cycle between periods of eating and fasting can improve insulin stability, cholesterol levels, blood pressure, mental alertness, and energy. And so that's usually um, 16, and a lot of people do the 16 and eight where they eat within an eight hour period, whenever that eight hour period is in your day, but then you fast for 16 hours in between where you drink water or maybe a super light snack of a fruit or something. I, I'm mostly, I, you know, I was doing this for years, didn't even know. Um, <laughs> but so when I fast, I fast, there's no food intake in, except for, uh, I'm gonna say pop, which I know is not good, it's horrible. But I've been drinking a lot more water, especially after I started doing jujitsu. I had to take my water, increase my water intake tremendously. So, you know, for all the people in my life who looked at me, they was like, "Wow, jujitsu must be good. It made you drink water." <laughs> Constantly work on quitting bad habits, alcohol, smoking, sugar. These are things. Uh, inc- too much processed food, uh, caffeine. As you minimize, start to feel better. Start to try to minimize these things that you don't know are pulling you down. And it'll just continue to snowball the process of you becoming extraordinary. Make sleep your superpower. This is my the number one thing I always start off off teaching people because it's the most important thing that people take for granted. Um, and so everything I talk to people about sleep, do you have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up early and looking at your sleep hygiene to maximize a lot of wearable devices now can really help. With that, where you know if you're in REM sleep, deep sleep, if you have awakenings through the night, but sleep is probably the most important thing you can work on. Um, and I even when you would see patients or individuals are being treated, you know they're getting better if they're in a hospitalized setting. A lot of them have, and mostly everyone, have come in for depression, anxiety, psychosis, they have sleep disturbance. And once they start sleeping better, you know they were getting better, even for the depressed people, the anxious people. The psychotic people, individuals with these conditions, not. Once you start seeing them sleep better, you knew. And so, and that became a thing where, you know, in a, in a hospital setting, it can be very artificial where you, it can get to be like, oh, we'll wake the patients up so we can round and then, then we can do this. But I, when I got into the position of being the person who made those decisions of how the, the, the units were run, and I always saw from that, it was like, let these people sleep. Why are we waking them up early just because, you know, shift change, or we need to give the meds now so that the other, I was like, let these people sleep. We're messing up their natural rhythms of trying to get better. And, and you know, you, you, you see the proof is in the pudding, you know? Uh, with that said, you know what's coming. I love you. You love yourself. God loves us. And that's all that matters.